Every spring, when the first flowers bloom, you can find Ron Spindle at the Jackson Bottom Wetland Preserve in Hillsboro. He comes every day, at the same time every day, for a hundred days in a row. Ron is a beekeeper of sorts, and he's here to check his mason bee boxes. The connection that I feel with mason bees is basically because they are very docile and they're very, very manageable. Mason bees are one of Oregon's native bee species. Because they are a metallic blue-green, they're often mistaken for flies. They're also called blue orchard bees for their color and because they're really good at pollinating fruit trees. Get this, if you had an acre of apple trees, it would take anywhere from 30 to 40,000 honeybees to pollinate. But it only takes about 250 mason bees. See the mason bees? So they've become popular with orchard growers as well as backyard gardeners. Ron started like most folks. He attended a lecture on mason bees and learned the basics. But he had more questions. Because I haven't been formally educated as an entomologist, I would be called a citizen scientist. One of the benefits of being a citizen scientist is you can basically make the most of your curiosity. Most folks who discover mason bees will put up a nesting box in their backyard. But Ron didn't just stop at one. Well, I have 35 nesting stations and a total of about 500 nesting trays out across the county. Mason bees, like other native bee species, usually live in holes and cavities. When folks want to raise mason bees, paper tubes are often used for the nesting tunnels. But the problem with the paper tubes is that Ron couldn't look inside them to see what the bees did. So Ron turned to his woodworking skills. I've probably made, oh, close to 700 or so nesting trays. Um, One of the things that Ron was curious about was just how big a tunnel should he make? This set um, has nesting channels that are variable sizes. So we've done this experiment and in about 91% of the time, they will nest uh, predominantly in the 5 16 inch. Ron also wanted to learn more about the life cycle of mason bees, like how long it takes for them to emerge from their cocoons in the spring. In nature, this happens deep inside the tunnels. But we set up our cameras with Ron to find out. It's early spring, and the days are starting to warm. The bees are about to chew through their cocoons. When the temperature starts to rise, that means its metabolic rate rises, and it's been living off of its body fat. And if it's basically exhausted its body fat, it's starving to death. So it needs to get out of the cocoon to get some nourishment. The bee inside the cocoon can take anywhere from probably 15 minutes up to a couple of hours to chew the hole big enough for it to exit. Oh, there he goes. There he goes. Oh my God. There he is. There's yeah. his wings. The whole time he was an adult in the cocoon, he was pretty cramped in. So once he gets out, he's able to stretch everything out. Once he gets flight ready and flies off, he'll drink nectar and then basically just patrol uh, around trying mm -hmm. to find a female. They quickly mate with the females and then die. Then the pregnant females have the hard work to do. Every day, they collect pollen and nectar from flowers. In each foraging trip, she probably visits around 75 flowers. So this little pollen pile about the size of a pea represents 1,875, roughly, flower visits. So that's why the mason bees are such great pollinators. And then she'll lay one egg on it, which looks like a small rice pellet. Then they seal up a mud wall. This is why they're called mason bees. She'll gather pollen every day, lay an egg, and build a wall. Day after day, for about 30 days. She lays female eggs to the back of the tunnel, and males in the front. And then she dies. Honeybees are famous for forming hives and collectively working together. Mason bees work individually, 
They are known as solitary bees. But they can live right next door to each other. Ron calls them gregarious. Like the bees he tends, Ron works alone. But he's also gregarious too. He loves it when visitors stop to ask him questions. When uh, they first come out of their cocoons, the females will fly around in front of the nesting station and they'll memorize landmarks. They nested in every one of the drain holes in the aluminum window sills. So they, they will nest wherever they can get to. At nearby Lincoln Street Elementary, he set up a nesting box in the school garden and shares his passion for mason bees with second graders. Those metal holes. He's been in that cocoon for 10 months, so he's kind of trying to figure out what's outside here. Hey, remember what we talked about with the mason bees and how the males don't sting? Okay, see, there's a bee on my thumb. If Ron had his way, more and more folks would raise mason bees in their backyard. I think anybody that can raise mason bees should raise mason bees. And the fact that it has a 300-foot foraging range means that if you do raise mason bees in your backyard, you're probably going to improve the pollination that's occurring in your yard and your surrounding neighbor's yard. Ron's research is helping us better understand these little native bees. But it's slow and methodical. So Ron continues his solitary work. And like the mason bees, they'll return every spring. Another day of data, yep. 